fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCO 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. And of course, I'm Al Warren. Mr. Dave Martino is here. Hello, hello. Okay, now today uh, we're starting another week. We've got a great interview for you today. Um, very interesting man. And he's got a, a great uh, book that we're going to talk about and an anniversary and all sorts of stuff here. So uh, let's get him in here. His name is uh, Judd Newborn. So thank you for being here, Judd. It's a pleasure, Al. Thank you for having me. Well, Judd, before we get into the subject and and the book itself, and the people involved. Let's talk about yourself. Now, I see you have a PhD, and you're an author, and you've got all these things going on. Um, so, who are you uh, for the people? Well, no, yeah, who are you? No, so for the for the listeners, for the people who go, well, I've never heard of this guy. Who is he? So, who is he in general? Like, what's what's a good little bio that describes Judd? Let's see. Um, I. I am a, an author, um, a sometimes journalist, a multimedia, <clears throat> multimedia lecturer um, around the world and mostly in North America. Um, <clears throat> I'm a historian. I'm an anthropologist, cultural anthropologist by training, PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> what else? I'm a, I'm a, a poet. Uh, I write so country song. I'm the only Holocaust expert in the world who's also a country songwriter. How's that? You and Dolly Parton need to get together and yeah, who knows what we could come up with? But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I do a lot of things. Um, I also um, I, I help found New York's Holocaust Museum. It's called Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I was the founding historian and uh, worked also as a curator and sleuthing for artifacts was my best the thing I loved most. Um, and uh, today I'm a I'm the curator of c- celebrity guest programs for Long Island, New York Cinema Arts Center, where I bring in this here. This will sound impressive. I bring in Kennedy Center honorees. Uh, Nobel laureates, as well as Academy Award, Grammy, Emmy, Tony, uh, did I leave anything out? And Pulit- Pulitzer Prize winners to interview before live audiences. So I do a lot of things. My, my favorite thing, though, is my multimedia lecturing. Wow. You're just a man of many talents. Um, hey, maybe you can get Dave on one of your lectures there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what, what is Dave's specialty. We can bring him in. Yeah. <laughs> can you sing country songs? Well, I, I could. I he would. Could. He would. He yeah. would do that, too. Al would advise against it. But. Yeah, but, you know, <laughs> I'll I, do it. I'll send you a video of him performing uh, an Elvis song in New Orleans, in, in New Orleans <laughs> there. And uh, I'll tell you, after that, you you will block him forever. <laughs> New Orleans was very entertained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, a big, another big disaster. Um no, okay. So, so you've done all this stuff now. What is your primary focus when you um, are speaking and doing multimedia, and you're talking about a lot of this stuff? Um, now, I I take it as it's it's about the Holocaust and it's about anti-Semitism and extremism and that sort of thing. So, I kind of think that this is that's your your main focus when you take all of your talents that's what you're directing them at right right yeah and i and i i like it i'm not a uh, dry academic lecturer although my programs are solid you know historically and so forth i would prefer to think of myself as an entertainer on serious 
subjects. So um, that's why I do the mu multimedia approach, which also comes from my, my museum building background. So I have, I, I usually uh, incorporate um, stirring music, uh, compelling, uh, colorful slides, and suspenseful storytelling to uh, create a program and to deliver. So that's what I do most. And I have, uh, I have four programs, different programs. They're all unique. Uh, and um, the one that's most relevant to what we'll talk about today is called, well, now I have my problem with the titles. It's called, in the long title, Speaking Truth to Power, the White Rose Student Anti-Nazi Resistance and Heroes Today in the Fight for Democracy and Human Rights. So it's, this one has two parts. The story of this, these incredible young students who had, been ant, who had been Hitler Youth Leaders, fanatical Hitler Youth Leaders, who transformed uniquely to become the greatest heroes of the German anti-Nazi resistance. And... I then do part two, which is who are people I call white rosers? Who are heroes today who, facing the kinds of uh, issues of uh, assaults on democracy and human rights, who rise and emerge uh, as heroes uh, in confronting them and to inspire us? And in that program, and that's always, I always update that. So I, I have to leave out some heroes and bring in new heroes and new issues, which I'm doing right now. Uh, because I'm going to be giving this program at the Gable stage in Carl Gable's Florida soon. That's in the historic Biltmore Hotel, which is some kind of an art deco, you know, majestic place. Um, and they have a theater in there. And they're going to be showing a play called uh, We Will Not Be Silent by David Myers. And that's a play about the Sophie Scholl, who's one of the, hero the heroine of the White Rose students, uh, and her last days being interrogated by her Gestapo uh, interrogator. So I'll be doing a program that gives all of the historical and colorful background to a story that otherwise is, you know, focused keenly on her interrogation. And um, I'm also uh, going to uh, do audience talk back. So I'll be on stage and I've, that's fun. I've done that before. I, you know, after performances, I love working with theatrical people and other kinds of meet collaboration in other media. So I did this at the San Diego Old Globe Theater once. And that was just, it's just, I don't know. I guess I'm a, I'm a kosher ham, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not touching that one. That's okay. Oh. You can touch it. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> well, when we talk about that, but like when you talk about this stuff, uh, before we get into the uh, into the books here, just I, my one comment would be um, that the the times today, um, surprisingly, um, are really set back. I, you know, there's so much. Um, uh, you know, nationalism and white power and anti, anti gay, anti uh, Jewish, anti whatever. There's just a lot of stuff, and it's very extreme. It's very loud, and um, sometimes scary. And it's got a lot of people supporting it. I mean, we saw that with uh, the Trump rallies and the Trump things, and even even lately. Um, so you're that's one issue. Um, that you're faced with when you're doing this kind of presentation and when you're talking and stuff, you know, people saying, oh, there never was a Holocaust or, it's, you know, all that stuff. The other issue I come across is um, being in the media. I have a lot of friends that do different journalist things, and I know one of the reporters in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, and he does his on the street every week. And it was it was last summer, and he did uh, one of the questions he asked everyone that you know on the main drag in front of the department stores was, um, "Can you tell me what the Holocaust was?" And did you know that seven out of ten didn't know what it was? And in fact, the answers that that they gave were things like, um, "One woman said, isn't that the name of the um, space station?" <laughs> another another one said, is that that special mint when you go to a really nice restaurant that they oh. give you after dinner? Oh, um, my gosh. It, and, and so, and then the three out of ten that knew 
that what it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, he asked a follow-up question. How many people do you think died in the Holocaust? And the answers were like, oh, I don't know, 10,000 to 30,000. So see, so for me, I, I'm totally shocked, but I'm a 60-year-old man. I'm thinking, well, I don't know how they these people made it through high school without getting the information, but maybe it's just not being taught anymore or to a degree that's very minor. But so I look at that. So you, you kind of have two folds of a battle going on because you've got the, the ones that are just deniers and haters or just haters, and then the ones that just don't know what's going on. Right. Yeah, you're right. There's um, a lack of uh, historical literacy, can I call it that, uh, which happens, I guess, as the generations start to change and certain historical events recede, although the Holocaust is, a, is something that has always been since, well, for a long time, it's become part of our, uh, t- it's become like a touchstone for understanding uh, when uh, horrible events are taking place when power is being abused, when people are being uh, tortured, uh, ethnically cleansed, etc. So it's still there. And, you know, Ken Burns just recently did a, 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 a series on, a um, documentary series on America and the Holocaust. And I feel like that was maybe his effort to try to combat what you were talking about and try to remind people this is still something we need to hear about. Uh, and my program on the White Rose, which is based on my book, which is called Sophie Scholl and the White Rose. Pretty easy. Sophie Scholl, like Scholl, Dr. Scholl's foot baths, pardon the comparison, <laughs> but that's the name, <laughs> Sophie Scholl and the White Rose. I've got my feet in them right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I've, I've betrayed the Scholl brand. I'm wearing a different kind. But, but in any event, um, uh, the uh, subject matter of that book these young people who could have been gone to the, become the cream of the crop in german nazi german society and become ss people and whatever um they instead transformed remarkably and uniquely to become the greatest heroes of the german anti-nazi resistance and today in germany they're icons on a par with what Abraham Lincoln represents for us in America, which is kind of amazing because people here don't know about these icons. Uh, I suppose most of the world has heard about, or much of the world has heard about Abraham Lincoln. But for Germany and, and the, and the significance of the White Rose and what they did be, immediately becomes relevant always through all time which means that in my multimedia lecture program, I uh, have to constantly un- update part two, which is heroes today. And I have to uh, take account of what are the new developments that are happening in the world that involve what you just mentioned, um, authoritarianism, uh, uh, the normalization of the extreme right in this country, and it's also happening in Europe. Uh, and of course, there are other horrible things happening in the world where people need to stand up and take action. Uh, there's Putin's brainwashing of uh, the Russian population to support the Ukrainian the invasion of Ukraine. And right now, we see in Iran young women, and this will resonate more when I talk about Sophie Scholl, young women about the age of Sophie Scholl and even younger who have been protesting, and risking and losing their lives against a an extreme religiously religious oppressive regime uh, with the help of young men. So uh, I pull this all together and I'm, af- I'm afraid and, and as well as happy that the White Rose story, its inspirational message will always be relevant because bad things, you know, in terms of social prejudice, uh, bigotry, and abuse of power and human rights, that's always going to happen and we always need to do something about it. Well, first of all, the White Rose Resistance Group, just so we know, was a handful of students at the University of Munich uh, and a professor whom they enlisted in their anti-Nazi activities. And there were other people connected with them who helped in one way or another or got into trouble in one way or another because of an association with them. Uh, And there were some others elsewhere, but that was a handful of students. I'm saying that because uh, Sophie Scholl and her older brother Hans were not the only ones, and they're not the only ones who were executed by after daring 
to res- to uh, try and wake up the German population to the lies of Hitler, the the uh, robbing Germans of their civil and right rights, their freedom, their freedom of thought and expression, um, and also the mass murder of Europe's Jews. So let's go to Hans and Sophie, because they are the most interesting in terms of transformation. Um, Hans was, uh, how old was he? In 1933, when the Nazis came to power, uh, Hans was uh, about 15, I can't remember, yeah, 15, and Sophie was 12. And they both became part of the Hitler Youth Movement, which, of course, was a paramilitary, uh, ideologically indoctrinating uh, movement, because Hitler appealed to youth as the vanguard of the new racial folk community that he was going to build that would last supposedly for a thousand years. Uh, and um, so they became active against their parents' wishes. Their parents were Christian uh, Christian human, humanists, pacifists, and also social democrats, left, you know, liberal. Um, so there was tension in the house. But Sophie, Hans and Sophie went out there, and they were so talented, which will speak to what they did later in their transformation, that they rose very quickly to become leaders in the Hitler Youth. So Hans ultimately became a leader of 150 boys, and he uh, was chosen by, from, uh, by the city of Ulm. Ulm is a city in, on the Danube uh, in southern Germany, uh, where, by the way, Albert Einstein was born, and uh, has a major cathedral in it, one of the, the highest cathedral, I think, in Europe if not the world. Uh, in any event, um, he joined and became the leader of 150 Hitler Youth Boys. And in 1935, he was chosen to be the flag bearer at the 1935 Nuremberg Nazi rallies uh, for, for the, uh, the Hitler Youth of Ulm. So he stood there under the broiling sun, holding this uh, Nazi, heavy Nazi uh, swastika flag while Hitler was exhorting the youth to become uh, brutal, cruel, fearless. That's the kind of youth he wanted. Um, Sophie, who was 12 years old, also was, she was, they were both very um, energetic and talented. I have to use the word talented because their talents went in the wrong direction and then in a good direction, which is the great thing that people can change. Um, so uh, she also was a leader in the what they called the BDM, the Bund of Deutsche Mädchen, the Bund of German Girls, which was the girls' auxiliary of the Hitler Youth. They just divided it up. But she was a member of the Hitler Youth in that sense. Uh, and she became a leader. And they were both they both weren't cream puffs either. I mean, uh, there were times when Hans would waylay students who were on their way to church and dra- beat them up and drag them off to the Hitler Youth. Uh, a hall for a meeting, and uh, Sophie wasn't a cream puff either, but um, they had to, something happened which led them to transform, and I'll tell you about that. Um, maybe I should first tell you what they did. When they transformed, they came down to the University of Munich, and there had been this process, which I'll tell you about, that led them to this point, and at the University of Munich, now as fully as full anti-Nazis, um, they had to. They tried to figure out what could they say or do to affect. Basically, they were they were outraged by the complacency or the complicity of German the German middle class. The ed, could they themselves are university students from the middle class, so they were focusing on the educated middle classes who were basically the ones who enabled Hitler and were enjoying the benefits of the Third Reich when, uh, it, when it was providing benefits, which didn't last, obviously, and, they, and morale changed at a certain point. But they were, com- they were either complicit or they were complacent. They looked away from, uh, uh, from Hitler's crimes, the robbing of their own rights, and uh, the mass murder of Europe's Jews. And so... Hans and Sophie and their comrades, uh, Vivi Graf, Alexander Schmorell, uh, Trauter Lofrenz, um, they, and Professor Huber um, at the University of Munich, they tried to wake up Germans and uh, to see what was happening, break through the propaganda, break through, may I use the term what we use today, fake news. Uh, you know, fake news is, uh, I'll use it in a different way, though. Fake news is when, is not propaganda. Fake news is when you uh, 
when you don't want to be, to be when you want to divert criticisms and uh, not be examined, so you call everything fake news and undermine the capacity for anybody to know what the truth is, and that's what helps spread conspiracy theories and um, and authoritarianism. So, uh, getting back to this, the, the White Rose wrote leaflets. They started out in June of 1942, and they created um, they they wrote um, and composed a series a staccato burst of six anti-Nazi leaflets. They were unlike any leaflets that the Gestapo had ever seen. They were not ideological tracts that might be, you know, communist or socialist and, and directed to the working classes or something. They were eloquent, passionate. They quoted uh, Plato and Lao Tzu, but they also were passionate in trying to wake Germans up. Um, they said, tear away the cloak of indifference with which you've Covered your hearts. Decide. Choose a side before it's too late. Um, one of their mottos, uh, having named their leaflets the White Rose, was, we will not be silent. We are your bad conscience. The White Rose will not leave you in peace. And that was what they addressed in their leaflets, said to the German population. Uh, so they issued those leaflets, and it was a very dangerous enterprise. Um, you know, first of all, they had to get hold of a duplicating machine. And a duplicating machine was, they were expensive and they were a total, it was totally illegal for anyone privately to own one. Because the Nazis were aware that they would, there was the possibility of counter propaganda and leaflets were coming in from over the border, not from deep inside Germany, which is where the White Rose were. And they were doing this, by the way, from 1942 to 1943. This is at the height of Nazi power when people who wanted to resist the few that were there were uh, isolated. You know, and the White Rose wanted, they said, uh, we need to find one another again. A wave of unrest needs to go through the land. We need to link up, and then maybe we can throw off this, uh, this tyranny. So that was their plan. And um, they had to get the, the uh, printing, the, well, it's not really a printing press, uh, uh, this hand-cranked uh, duplicating machine. They had to, they, there was no internet in those days, everybody who's younger than whatever age. You couldn't push a button or put a notice on Facebook and suddenly gather up, you know, 10 or 50,000 people to protest somewhere. They had to write these leaflets. They had to compose them. They couldn't go to Wikipedia or the Internet. They had to hit the books and use their brains and their passion. And then they had to put them on these, you know, I don't really know how mimeographing works. And then they had to crank and crank day and night these things out to make enough to distribute. Um, and then they distributed them in daring ways, leaving them uh, in telephone booths and in restaurants and, of course, not being caught. But also they would get the addresses of people like doctors, uh, lawyers, uh, you know, professional people. And they'd stuff them, these leaflets, in envelopes and they'd mail them out. Um, they broadened this effort by the last two leaflets. Um, and ultimately they distributed 7,000 leaflets in 16 major German cities. They didn't just mail them from Munich. They also took dangerous train sorties where they would take a, a knapsack full of uh, leaflets, put them in some car in, uh, you know, some place in, in the car of a train, and then they'd go into a different car so that if those leaflets were found, they would not be associated with, with the person, you know, who could put them there. And then they would retrieve the uh, leaflets, and then they would go, let's say, from Munich to Frankfurt. And from Frankfurt, let's say, they'd mail the leaflets to Hamburg and to Vienna. And then someone else would go to Vienna and mail the leaflets to Frankfurt and to Berlin. So the Gestapo was, the idea was that the Gestapo should not know how big this mysterious white rose group was um, and how important they might be. Uh, so that's something that infuriated Hitler, because he certainly knew about it. In fact, they were so audacious, or let's use the Yiddish word, they had such chutzpah that they actually mailed Hit Hitler leaflets to Hitler's office. So Hitler was on the address list, um, and he got them in his Führer chancellery. Uh, and that, of course, uh, helped build ever more uh, uh, exhorting to uh, catch them. 
the Gestapo was very embarrassed. They were stymied. And Hitler ordered them to finally do something to catch these people. They didn't know who they were. Um, and so the Gestapo process started to move forward. And a couple of things happened that ultimately led to their being captured. But the biggest thing that happened, and the reason why Germans remember them today uh, as the epitome of what it means to have civil and moral courage, is when in, on February 18th, 1943, just after the devastating defeat of the German Wehrmacht, the army at Stalingrad in Russia, when like hundreds of thousands of Germans were, were frozen or killed, and people back in uh, Germany knew this was a kind of turning point. How could the Third Reich, how could Hitler win a war on two fronts? Uh, and so, it, and it could only be done, obviously, with some kind of a fanatical effort. And fanaticism was one of the major uh, elements of what it meant to be a Nazi and what it was one of the components of the Third Reich. Um, so uh, Hans and Sophie, on February 18th, took 2,000 of their sixth leaflet, which, by the way, was written by this one professor whom they managed to get involved with them, Professor Kurt Huber, who was a sometime librettist for Karl Orff, of Carmina Burana fame, the composer who was a Nazi favorite, actually, and abandoned Huber when he was caught. In any event, they went into the University of Munich on Thursday, February 18th, with their leaflets in a suitcase. So the suitcase was filled just perfectly with 2,000 leaflets. And they, while the students, while the, the atrium of the university was empty, and it has a big, beautiful atrium, they put stacks of leaflets outside different classroom doors, which had, of course, behind them students in class. And after they'd put them in different places, they were going out to escape the front entrance when they realized that they still had 300 leaflets left. So now, in what could be considered a foolhardy action, but one in keeping with their idea of awakening the public, they went back into the university and climbed up to the highest gallery surrounding the atrium. And as the bell rang for the change of class, they pushed 300 leaflets over the balustrade so that came, they came floating down upon the heads and into the hands of the students who were starting to pour into the atrium and on the staircases. Um, that was the only public protest, the only fundamental public protest by Germans against Nazism ever to occur. So they are remembered for that. And they are also remembered for having been the first ones to call out to Germans against the mass murder of Jews. They said in leaflet number two in June of 1942, we... Um, over Since the beginning of the war, 300,000 Jews have been murdered in the most bestial fashion. And it wasn't 3,000, it was 300,000, it was 2 million by then, but this is what they knew so far. Um, this is a crime unparalleled in human history, a crime against the dignity of man. Those are the kind of words we only heard in the Nuremberg trials, the notion of a crime against humanity, but they said it years earlier. And they said, um, everyone wants to be exonerated. You all want to sleep in happy complacency, but you all, why are we telling you this since you all already know about it? So they were giving the lie to German comments and statements that we didn't know what was happening. Uh, and they said, um, that's when they said, we will be your, we are your bad conscience. Take, take action. We won't leave you in peace. Uh, so they're remembered for that and for this act of political theater when they tossed the leaflets down. Within, uh, very shortly, like in, like in, uh, 10 minutes, the Gestapo, the, uh, university's janitor spotted them and he called out, uh, halt! You are arrested in the name of Volk und Führer. And he managed to grab them and they just went limp because the truth is, think about what they did. You know, were they in, they're totally, what did they, were they totally in acting in a sense of reality or were they already, uh, you know, losing losing it a bit because of the day and night uh, cranking out of leaflets, because they felt that the Gestapo was on their trail. There were some hints about that. 
And uh, they were also taking amphetamines to keep themselves going. They were, some of them were medical students. Hans was a medical student, so he had access to things like that. Um, so you could say that what they did was foolhardy, but at the same time, it was in keeping with their idea that you have to speak up. You have to publicly declare uh, what's going on. And so those are the actions that brought them. Then they were Hitler. Um, then they were captured by the Gestapo after the uh, janitor got hold of them. And they were uh, interrogated, um, each separately, um, over the weekend. And on Monday, uh, February 22nd, 1943, 80 years ago, this coming February, they were subjected to a show trial. Um, Hitler had ordered, uh, at his personal behest, um, uh, Judge Roland Freisler, the head of the Volksgerichtshof, the folk people's court, court, to fly down from Berlin to try them. Uh, these were the first to be arrested of the White Rose. Also, uh, another comrade, Christoph Probst, a very a gentle father, a young man, 23, who had three children, toddlers and an infant. His wife had just given birth in the hospital. He was rounded up. And it's very exciting, uh, actually, and uh, why he was caught, how he was caught, uh, which I can tell you if you want to ask me that later. Um, and uh, they were taken for the show trial. They were abused because of, uh, in Nazi Germany, uh, the judge was called, this judge was the hanging judge of the Third Reich. That's how he was known, Roland Freisler. And so a, a, a trial meant haranguing them and calling them parasites and schmarotza and uh, every bad word you can think of, uh, giving them almost no space to say anything. When he finally shut up and said, do you have anything to say for yourself? Or what do you have to say for yourself? Sophie Scholl called out in a clear, small voice, what we said and wrote other people are thinking. They just don't dare open their mouths. And Hans Scholl said, where we stand now, you will stand soon. Your heads will roll too. Uh, now, I don't know how, knowing that they were being, con they were condemned to death, but they knew it was coming. How did they find the strength to talk back to him in a packed trial with, the, with Nazi elite in, in Munich, uh, they must have been trembling underneath it all, you know, because they were facing the reality soon of death. Uh, and, they, and Sophie was only 21, and Hans was 23 at this point, and Christoph was 20, uh, 24, and Christoph was 23. So they were taken back to uh, the prison after being condemned to death. And in the prison, they only had a few minutes to say goodbye to their parents who had been told about their arrest and had come down from Ulm to Munich in a great hurry to try and see them and also to launch an appeal. You could put in an appeal and there were 90 days by, believe it or not, Germany considered itself still to be a, a state of law, you know, ha ha. And there was supposed to be 90 days for an appeal to be carried out before someone was executed by the fo folks, people's court, the people's court. But so the parents, in despair, not knowing what would happen, left to put in that appeal. Immediately thereafter, Hans, Chris, Sophie, and Christoph, each separately, were led across the cobblestone prison courtyard to a small room. There they were beheaded. Hans called out as he went to his death, so that his voice would reverberate to every prisoner in every cell window in the courtyard of the prison. Es lebe die Freiheit, long live freedom. And then he too was ushered into that small room where they were guillotined. But it didn't end with that. The uh, last leaflet of the White Rose uh, was smuggled out of Germany, sent to a, a, a kind of a subgroup of the White Rose in Hamburg. And uh, when the Allies got hold of it, they reproduced it in great printed form and made, but made millions of them, and they dropped them from bombers by the tons in July of 1943 over the cities and fields of Germany. Thomas Mann, the great Nobel laureate for literature, was in exile, and he broadcast back on a, a station called Deutsche Hörer, German listeners, to Germany, 
words like this, I can't, I don't have it in front of me, but he said, good, splendid young people, you will not have died in vain, you will not be forgotten. The Nazis have raised monuments to common killers, but those statues will be torn down, and in their place, monuments will be built to these people, who at a time of, that was the darkest for Germany and Europe, knew and publicly declared a new faith and honor and freedom is dawning. So uh, that's kind of the, the fact that they their message lived on. And Germans didn't conf acknowledge what they had done for some time. After the war, they were considered traitors, right? They stabbed us in the back. For a while, the White Rose was looked upon as these mushy Christian martyrs, because they were Christians. They were inspired by, by Christian humanism not the organized church which had kowtow, which had kowtow to the Nazis. Uh, and uh, so they were sort of latched on to as these mushy martyrs. And that was like the only people that teachers would talk about. And otherwise they didn't even teach about the Third Reich. It was as if German history went from whenever to 1933. Then there was this big nothing. And then 1945, you know, it comes back with Adenauer. Uh, then in 1969, with the big student unrest around the world, Students got hold of the White Rose story, and they learned about the Holocaust, and they started saying to their parents, what did you do in the, door, in the war, Daddy, or Mama? And um, they then re they, they regained, they uh, retrieved the political uh, basis of the White Rose, that they were not intending to be martyrs, they didn't want to be caught, and that they had a purpose, an ideological purpose, which was based on... Uh, democracy, basically. They wanted to see a democratic state with full human rights. So they started to be, be, um, become more and more famous. And in 1982, there was a movie made about the White Rose that revealed at the end that some of the judges who had condemned them were still working in the German courts in the 1960s. Uh, the film really shook a lot of people up. I saw it in Germany, and when they pick up Sophie Scholl to put her on the uh, table where the guillotine is, is, everybody, it seemed, in the theater, mostly young people, grabbed one another's arms because it was such a, uh, an unbelievable... You had so identified with her, you know? It was just such a moment. Um, and then other things happened in Germany, and they, they were accepting the Holocaust as a subject matter. Germany has d dealt with the Third Reich far better than most countries have ever dealt with their uh, crimes. I mean, have we dealt with the crimes of, of uh, you know, ethnically cleansing and killing America's Native Americans, the, the so-called the Indians? No, we haven't. Um, but Germans have. They've come, the, the, the Holocaust and the evils of the Third Reich have become a major part of German common popular consciousness and a touchstone for how to behave. And the White Rose are the epitome of civil courage. And so the White Rose now, there are, thousands, there are hundreds of streets and schools named after them. There have been three feature films, one nominated for an Academy Award Best Foreign Film in 2006. That was about Sophie's last days of interrogations. Um, there, uh, there are two operas. There's uh, plays. There's the greatest German literary prize uh, for humanitarian literature is named after them. Uh, the entrance of the University of Munich has these stone scatterings of what look like leaflets so that when students step over the entranceway into the University of Munich, they have to walk past the words and see the words and deeds of the White Rose. So there was a TV. I'm, I'm going to finish this thing. They were, I'll tell you my the secret. There was a TV um, competition in 2003 to choose the 10 most important Germans of all time. And students, it was a month-long competition, and students, or young people, sorry, people under the age of 40, not just students, um, catapulted Hans and Sophie Scholl into fourth place, beating out Bach, Goethe, Gutenberg, Bismarck, Willy Brandt, and Albert Einstein. Uh, and now I would think, because of how things have, in, have how their reputation has grown, they might have, they might be voted into number one, first place, if it was, uh, if, if this was competition was held again. So that's the story of the White Rose. And I'll tell you about the secret of why they transformed, if we have time. And, um, 
and why they use the name White Rose. These are the two major mysteries that have never been solved. And by the way, in Germany, as you can imagine, there's an incredible literature about the White Rose. I mean, here we don't know about them. There, there's book of book, books, articles. There's so much stuff. And then in my multimedia program about the White Rose, um, I talk about uh, heroes today in the fight for human rights. And I bring up people who I call White Rosers. Um, and I could tell you who some of my examples are. You know, you're right how the German culture has um, absorbed their past, the, the sin, so to speak, the Holocaust, the, 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 bad, the, the bad things they did to the world, you know. And not only have they absor absorbed everything, they've uh, made it a part of their life today in the sense of never let it it happen again like it's a part of every day like even the way that they've um redone their streets and stuff it's not like they they're putting up a, a a big poster or a statue or something they do it in a in in a sense of um something that you see every, in in your everyday life and that and i'm just wondering why the germans in particular have been so good at that as compared to a lot of the other nations like even America or Japan or some of the other ones that have done some awful things as well in their history, whereas they don't seem to. Yeah. Well, you know, just hearing that question, I just have to start thinking because um, I haven't really wondered why. But um, I think it must be because not just the Holocaust, which was took a long time believe it or not, for the world to acknowledge and recognize what had happened to Jews in particular, singled out uh, by the Nazis for total annihilation. Um, but the whole uh, issue of World War II and the evils of the Third Reich, I think, and then the Nuremberg trials that made it, uh, you know, opened it up to the world's consciousness. I think that made um, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust a major issue for the world and for Germans in particular. They were occupied, of course, at first by the Allies. They had, they never could not look at it. It was, you know, we don't look at what's happening in, in Native American reservations and realize how much alcoholism is there and how how poorly their situation is because of American policies and neglect. Um, in Germany, they couldn't escape it. It was everywhere. Now, people would say um, that they didn't want to hear about it, but they were still hearing about it. <laughs> Um, I remember when um, there was a long time there was a mini series called Holocaust. It was about the same time as Roots, and some people called it the Jewish equivalent of Roots. Um, and I was in Germany at the time. It was like 1979, and in Germany, in America, it was just shown on TV. In Germany, it was a, a national event. They divided up the different segments into several different nights, and uh, they had a bank of, um, of people on te manning telephones so that Germans could call in and re relate to it. And they had experts. Uh, and people would call in, and one person would cry and say, oh, I never realized it was like this. How come I never knew about this? And another person would call, I remember, and say, Can't we finally have an end to talking about this? So there were always right-wing types in Germany, people who didn't want to think that they had any... Uh, part in any of this. Um, but Germany as a whole, maybe with German thoroughness, I don't know, that we talk about, um, did con confront it. Uh, and uh, I think today uh, you can't, there are speeches in Parliament that will mention it. If there's some kind of outrage going on in Germany, let's say an anti Semitic outrage, it will, people will gather very quickly and they will protest, and they will often carry white roses. So, uh, so yes, it's sunk into German political culture as well as consciousness. They can't escape it, and so they, they, they dealt with it. Yeah, yeah. It just seemed to be um, better received um, on even, even how they did it, like in the memorial sets. You know, like I said, you can go certain streets and find out where this person was killed here, but it's still an open place. It's not uh, like a big memorial. Do you know what I mean? Like they set it all up throughout Germany where you, you always know what's going on, but they seem to care about it. Yes, I think they do. Although we should be aware that 
like uh, in this country now and in Italy and Sweden even and uh, Spain, there are right extreme right wing parties and Germany has one too. It's called the AFD, the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, the Alternative for Germany. And that's a far right party. And um, Germans have to now speak up about that, those who don't agree with it. Uh, so it's it's dangerous. Germany has the same you know, threats that we have to democracy, and they're growing. Uh, so, so, yeah, we need those people in Germany who gather together and protest uh, and remember this subject matter and don't let the, the alternative for Germany get away with it. I'm going to have an article with the big, big reveal uh, in, in intriguing detail in Smithsonian Magazine uh, online in February, uh, which will be the 80th anniversary of the White Rose. But you're going to get the scoop. Um, in 1937, 38, Hans Scholl, who had now had just, he was barely 19, had just become a cavalry soldier. Um, and was still considered himself, he thought he was going to have a military career, who knows where that would have gone politically. He was suddenly arrested for a same-sex relationship that he had had when he was a teenager, much younger. He had had a relationship from in 1934, 35, into 36, two, two years almost, with another young man, another boy. Uh, and suddenly, he and 20 other members of, uh, of people who had been in his Hitler Youth Troop, who were also, I don't want to make this too complicated, were also in an alternative youth group um, that at the time was not yet illegal. They uh, were all rounded up and they were tried for being in the alternative group, but the most serious crime was, uh, was that of homosexuality. And of course, homosexuals in Germany were... Uh, criminalized, homosexuality was criminalized, um, even, in the, even rumors about homosexuality could get you into trouble. Ultimately, more than 100,000 uh, men were imprisoned in the harshest of prisons, not even a regular prison, and, and, and 50, uh, 100,000 arrested, 50,000 in prisons, and a number of them went to concentration camps where they had to wear a pink triangle to signify that they were homosexual. And they were treated with utmost brutality, even more so than many other categories of prisoner during the 30s, late 30s. Um, so Hans Scholl suddenly was arrested and um, interrogated by the Gestapo. Um, and uh, this is like, can you imagine the shock that that had for him? And as it turns out, he had been struggling and trying to suppress these uh, gay feelings. Um, and he spoke quite uh, openly, candidly to the Gestapo. But of course, he also said uh, that he doesn't know, his, he must have been crazy and he can't imagine why he did that and blah, blah, blah. Um, so, uh, so when the trial happened in front of neighbors and friends from Ulm and the, and the boy he had had a relationship was pressured into giving state witness um, because you can imagine what the Gestapo said they would do to him if he didn't help them with their trial. Um, Hans was one of two convicted. Um, this, then he was, he was led off because of his stellar record in the Hitler Youth, but, and some other factors. But this thrust those issues about his sexual identity back into his mind, and he could no longer suppress or repress them. And so this became a formative moment in his character. This was the turning point. It didn't happen instantly, but this is when he realized he was marginalized to the Third Reich, to Nazism, to Nazi ideology, so-called culture, and that he didn't have a place there, and that there had to be something else. So it was, that was the, the baptism of fire that transformed him and his sister, who adored him, uh, over a few years into, ever more, into anti-Nazis. And as they got older, they saw and heard more about what was wrong with the Third Reich, the evils, and their consciousness um, expanded uh, until they realized that they had to identify with humanity and not with some rapidly ethnocentric Aryan uh, you know, culture as, as supposedly superior. So that's the big reveal of why they transformed. Um, and that's a shock, I have to tell you, to Germans to hear this. 
um, I just told it to a German school class and some teachers, and they had never heard of such a thing. But they were good about it because Germany is good about uh, gay rights, very good. Um, they've had gay mayors of Berlin and whatnot, um, and, equal, and marriage equality. Uh, and then the other thing is, why did they call themselves the White Rose? And I'm going to tell you very, very quickly. Nobody knows, nobody knew, anyone who survived, who had anything to do with them, including someone who was a core member, who now lives in South Carolina and is 105, she didn't know. They didn't tell everybody everything, because when you're captured by the Gestapo, like in every good political cell, creations of political cells of resistance, you don't want to let everyone know everything that's going on, so that if you're captured, you don't betray somebody or some secret. So nobody knew why they were called the White Rose. It died with Hans Scholl and his uh, friend Alexander Schmorell, who wrote the leaflets. But there is a German novel called Die Weiße Rose, The White Rose. And it was written by an author, a German author who had been a left-winger, who had escaped from Germany during, in, in, during the turmoil after World War I, went to Mexico, and started writing novels back and sending them back to German left-wing publishers. And one of his novels was, well, his name was B. Traven, and he wrote The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which became a classic film, Hollywood film with Humphrey Bogart, made by John Huston. That's the only success he ever had. Otherwise, he kept his identity. His identity was as, as elusive as Quicksilver. He had 12 passports. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. Um, but he also wrote a book called Device of Rosa, which he sent back to Germany. And in this book, um, all of the principles, really, of the White Rose students are, are, are they almost spoken out in the uh, narrative. Um, and it resonates so powerfully that I, can sh that I think I've shown, and you have to read my Smithsonian uh, Magazine article, I think I've made a very con uh, convincing argument that this is where this name of the White Rose came from. And it's intertwined with other arguments and threads, which I haven't told you about, that create, you know, the, pull, the threads come together and you get whole cloth, finally, of these two secrets interwoven. They're interwoven because Hans Scholl probably got banned books, and all of B. Travin's books were banned and burned, from a bookseller who was his closest friend and was a homosexual, gave him banned books. And uh, there was, they were marginalized together. And Hans found a confidant, not a personal relationship. The guy was 47 and whatever. But a, um, someone who he could, the only person he could tell his secrets to. And I believe that's where he got, must have gotten the book, The White Rose. And he didn't want to betray his bookkeeper friend um, when the Gestapo asked him, why did you call yourself The White Rose? So he disguised it. But in the manner in which he disguised it, I believe I showed that it comes from the B. Traven novel. So, and just help divert attention from the bookseller so that the Gestapo wouldn't, uh, wouldn't prosecute him. So that's a very complicated story, and you've got to read the article. But those are two reveals that in Germany are like, you know, it's like you reveal something major about Abraham Lincoln or uh, whoever. It's big for them. What is it you hope people take away when they pick up this book, what is it you want people to get from this book? Well, as I say in the preface, the story of the White Rose is ever more urgent today. Um, we see, as I discuss in my multimedia programs, we see all sorts of um, ethnic cleansing. We see uh, d deceit coming from the state. We see politicians who are craven, uh, who go along with Right now, today, I'm just, I'm expanding um, with this normalization of the right wing, extreme right wing, with the embracement of, uh, embracing of conspiracy theories that are either ludicrous, like the QAnon theories, or, uh, or the more pernicious uh, theory of the great replacement, the notion that, um, that Jews are the motor underneath the puppet masters who are bringing about the replacement of the white race with, uh, you know, immigrants and, and Muslims and God knows what. And things that appeal to people's resentment, 
um, sense of alienation and powerlessness. And we need people to take the lesson of the White Rose story in order to do what Thomas Mann had said, to know and publicly declare, to speak up, take positions of, uh, to inform the people, break through the, the uh, pernicious notion of fake news, don't believe the lies, and, uh, do, and speak truth to power and wake people up. And that's something that, uh, let's say, let's give an example. Um, by the way, I grew up a Republican, by the way. Um, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are white roses to me because they've screwed up, they've, they've ruined their uh, political careers, they've put them on the line, they've faced being totally ostracized by their party, um, they, uh, are, they get, you can imagine the kinds of threats they get from the population uh, out there, who the MAGA population, no doubt many death threats, not only to them, but as, this is what happens to a lot of these people, to their families, uh, awful st stuff. And uh, there they are, in the face of all of these craven Republican representatives in Congress who can't and won't distance themselves from Trump, from his Holocaust denial, from his uh, bloated, uh, uh, his bloated uh, personality cult, and uh, simply bow down kiss the ring, and now maybe they're kissing it without bowing totally down, but when are they going to actually come right out and say what they need to say and take a position? I mean, rip up the Constitution, please. That's, that's so beyond the pale. There should be a tremendous hue and cry from the uh, Republican Party, and there isn't. But Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney are the ones who are calling out. So let's give them the credit for being white rosers who are knowing, publicly declaring, and doing what the white rose would have wanted them to do. So I think that kind of covers it. How do people find Judd Newborn, and, and how do they find out about your presentations and your do you have a website? Do you do social media? What, what's the connection with, uh, with Judd? Well, I do have a website. I haven't, you know, modernized it, but uh, that's – it's still functional and good and has all the information you need. And it's my name. Uh, my name is Judd with one D. Even though I write country song lyrics, I'm not one of the Judds who have two Ds. So it's www.juddjud, newborn, like a newborn baby, juddnewborn.com. So you can find me there and see my different programs, which there are others besides this one, of which I'm proud. And um, I happen to be on Facebook, although, you know, I don't know how many people can reach me that way. Um, I've already got, like, up, coming up to the limit of friends you can have. Um, but I'm on there. Um, I'm not active on Twitter, and I'm thinking uh, I may get rid of my account there anyway. Um, I'm, I'm on Instagram, but I haven't really pursued it. So I don't know. That seems to be the big thing now. Um, I'm definitely not, not dancing on TikTok. Uh, oh, come on. So the uh, best way is to go to the website. And if you want to see the book, you go to Amazon.com and you just put in my name, Judd Newborn. And uh, I guess that's the way to get hold of me. Yeah, and if I okay. Yeah, we will have that up on our website so people can find you with one click, get the book, and uh, check, check out your website and, and everything that you do. And people, you should. This is very interesting, and it's very, very important with these times uh, to, to to learn things, to get involved. So Absolutely. we really appreciate you coming on the show, John. And this is a very important topic. Uh, of course, we're, we were talking about the uh, the book of uh, so Sophie Shaw and uh, the White Rose, and. Um, the guest, Judge Newborn. Thank you for being here. It's my pleasure. And thank you, Alan and Dave. Thanks, Judd. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.